uh, on the spacecraft. Uh, mine is one of two that are inside the analytical laboratory. So uh, when the thing's going around on Mars and looking at stuff, uh, there are mast instruments that take pictures of things. Uh, there are arm instruments that uh, just put, a, put a, a thing down on the rock or, or drill a rock. And then my instrument, Kemen, is actually inside the body of the rover. And uh, the, the, the sampling arm and drill would, would deliver a small powdered sample to me, and then I would analyze it. And so uh, what Kemen does is it's the, uh, it's the first instrument ever to land on Mars uh, that will give you the mineralogy of Mars soils and rocks uh, for the first time. So that's, the, uh, that's, that's what we hope is going to happen on the 6th of August or uh, soon thereafter. Now, um, I have some slides to show you exactly how the instrument works. And then I have uh, one, of our, one of our field instruments here in the orange box. And I'm actually going to run some analyses. Uh, and I sort of know what these are, so it's, I won't be stumped by the answer. But I'm going to pretend I don't know. And I'll show you how uh, Kevin would analyze these things on Mars. And I'll show you how the instrument works. So uh, first of all, let's go to the uh, first slide here. And uh, this is uh, so uh, it's a, it gives you definitive uh, mineralogy of, of Mars soil and rocks. Uh, it uses a technique called X-ray diffraction. And X-ray diffraction is actually not a new technique. Uh, this actually next year when, Mar when uh, Curiosity lands on Mars is the uh, 100th anniversary of the invention of X-ray diffraction. So it's a big deal for mineralogists and diffractionists. Um, it'll identify all the minerals present in soils and rocks. Uh, now why, why is that important? Uh, you know. Um, Minerals are, are phases, and they're stable on, only under certain conditions of temperature and pressure and, and chemical uh, things, things around them. And the result is if we know what the minerals are in a rock or in a soil, we can tell you what the environment was when they were formed. And, and that's exactly what we want to know. Uh, when we go to Gale Crater, we want to know when we land there, uh, what was the condition there? Uh, three and a half, four billion years ago, was there a lake there? Was it a river? Was there no water at all? We don't think there was no water at all, but, but we will know from the mineralogy. So uh, next slide. OK, so we use x-ray diffraction for mineral characterization. We also do x-ray fluorescence, which tells you what elements are present in the minerals. And there's only a single detector for this. It's a CCD, just like the kind of thing that's in your camera. Uh, there's no moving parts. and uh, the only, the only moving part of the instrument is actually a wheel that rotates the sample into position. Everything else uh, doesn't have to move. Uh, next slide. OK, so here's, here's, the, uh, here's the instrument. There's basically uh, an x-ray tube here, just like you might have uh, when you get your teeth x-rayed. Uh, there's an x-ray beam. There's a little pinhole collimator. And it makes a little tiny pencil beam that's about 70 microns in diameter. It's smaller than a human hair. And the sample sits here in a transparent cell. Uh, and the grains inside this transparent cell are, are rotated around and moved by sound. So we actually have a little vibration system that you'll hear it when I, play, when I, when I run the sample. You'll hear it whistling. And these grains move around in the beam. And diffraction occurs with the crystalline materials, and they form these rings. And these rings, when, when, we, when we bring these images down to Earth, we form these uh, one-dimensional things called diffractograms by looking at the intensities going outward from the central beam. And these diffractograms uh, will tell you the minerals present and how much of each mineral is present. It's absolutely definitive. And, uh, and I don't, I don't want to say it's foolproof, <laughs> but it's close to it. OK, uh, let's see. Next slide. Uh, so here's an example. This is, uh, this, is one, this is actually from the flight instrument. This is one, uh, one ten second exposure of a CCD frame. This CCD is 600 by 600 pixels, so it's a really small sensor compared to what you're used to in your kind of cameras. But it detects x-rays directly. And it not only detects the x-rays, but it measures their energies. Each, each one of these little pixels in here measures the energy of a photon that strikes it, individual photons. So out of this 10 second frame, over here, you can see we're, we're starting to see these rings. Well, this is a particularly strong diffraction. Uh, this is quartz and beryl. That's one of our standards. Very strong diffraction. You can actually see these rings developing in 10 seconds of analysis. And this is the 2D or 1D scan here. And these peaks 
uh, although there's a lot of noise here, these peaks, I could analyze this and tell you this was barrel and quartz. And then if you look down here, if you take the energies of all these photons that struck this detector and display them here, you can see this is cobalt. That's the actual x-ray beam that comes out of the, the tube. And then we've got uh, chrome. There's a little argon from the atmosphere, uh, silicon, aluminum, and so forth. And this, this chrome, now this, uh, this barrel, they wanted to make sure it was exactly perfect, so we had to use emeralds. It's one of the reasons why the machine was, no, it's not really the reason why the machine was expensive. But uh, we were told we had to use gem quality emeralds to make the, uh, the crushed material for this. And, and the coloring agent in, in emerald is chrome. So that's three, uh, three tenths of 1% chrome that was in that material. OK, uh, next slide. So we take uh, maybe 100 of those individual frames and sum them up. And you can see we're starting to get a pattern here. And then we take about five or 10 of those 100 frame sets and make one major frame. And that becomes an analysis. And that has very low noise. And, and it's very easy to tell from that what's present. Uh, next slide. And uh, we developed a number of prototypes for this machine. This is actually what we called Kemen 4. That was our first what we called portable. But it just about killed us dragging it up the mountain. So it wasn't that portable. And this is up in Spitsbergen, Norway, 80 degrees north. Um, and it was the first analysis in the field by x-ray diffraction. Um, next slide. So from that, we started developing other instruments. And actually, some of these are com the thing I'm showing you here is actually a commercial instrument that was developed by a company that one of my uh, postdocs actually started. And so this, uh, this is what we called, it was originally called Mini Kemen because it was supposed to be smaller than Kemen. They called it Terra. And then this was one that we had that went in uh, robotic vehicles that we called Roboterra. And this was a reflection instrument that was uh, made by the, for the Getty Museum for looking at artworks. And next slide. And then this just shows some of the, this is up on Mauna Kea for a, for a uh, uh, in situ resource utilization uh, experiment for, the, for lunar stuff. This is in the dry valleys of Antarctica. This is up in northern Canada. And this is, again, in Spitsbergen. Uh, next slide. Uh, well, this is in the Utah desert. Uh, but they wanted to, people wanted to try this to see if an astronaut in, with gloves could use it, and they sort of could. This is uh, seven kilometers down in a potash, potash mine in uh, New Mexico, and they needed to know which way to dig, and they, otherwise they'd have to assay the ore out of the mine and in a different county. And, and we're also using this to analyze lunar rocks. You'd be surprised there's still a lot of research being done on lunar rocks. This is Jeff Taylor at the University of Hawaii. And we're analyzing 100 lunar soils with this. And they're going to be the baseline data for orbital in, uh, missions to the moon. Um, OK, let's stop for that right now. And I kind of wanted to give you a flavor of it. Now I'm going to really show you the machine. And, and this, is, this, is what I, this really is what I wanted to show you. This was just kind of like an intro. So this is, uh, this is functionally identical to the thing we're sending to Mars. Uh, the difference is that there are commercial components in here. Uh, when I put a sample in, I put the sample in. It's not a wheel with an automatic uh, uh, gizmo. Uh, and when I prepare a sample, I don't have the real fancy arm with the thing. So I've got a hammer. And this is called a percussion mortar. I, I sent this all over the world with my little kit. And I had to describe all the components uh, through customs. And uh, the first time I called it a percussion mortar, I had serious issues. So I, so I just called it a sample preparation device after that. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, this is, uh, uh, we've been all over the place with this. It's battery powered. It's, it's uh, wireless. So I'm actually communicating it wireless with this, this, this thing, this uh, computer. And let me, uh, so let me show you how I prepare a sample, and then I'm going to show you the nuts and bolts of what an observation looks like. So first of all, uh, I went all over in front of the Hilton trying to find rocks. And there's just no rocks in this. Th there's no rocks in Florida. I'm pretty well convinced. <laughs> so I've got some beach sand here. Uh, I've got a couple of seashells. And I've got an aspirin tablet. So I'm going to start with the beach sand. <laughs> and uh, I'm not sure how fine grained this is, so I'm going to grind it up just a little bit. So I'm just going to put some beach sand in here. Whoops. 
My apologies to the custodial staff. And I just want to make sure there's enough fine-grained material to analyze. Let's try this. Now this is a this is a 150 micron sieve. This is the same diameter sieve uh, uh, sieve diameter that is used on MSL. So I'll show you what this looks like uh, after I'm done. You can see what how, how small the, the the holes are, and just for for scale, a human hair is about 100 microns. So the holes are about the size of a human hair in diameter. 100 microns, yeah. Well, no, this is 150. And there's, there's two kinds of ways to hit things. There's whacking and there's thwacking. And so uh, whacking is when you just really whack something. Thwacking is you give it a, a sharp rap. And that's the kind of thing that works for, uh, you know, for things like this. And there's, a, there's actually kind of a joke that uh, there was a, what they call a, a, a critical design review for the sample preparation equipment for MSL. And it lasted three days. And we, everybody was just dead tired. It was 6 at night on the third day. And uh, uh, the, guy, the guy who was answering questions, um, basically, uh, somebody asked him. He said th they were thwacking. And, he, and somebody asked him the question, you know, what's the difference between whacking and thwacking? And he basically said, I'll tell you the answer to that. Or I'll, I'll, I'm going to show you the answer to that if you ask me another question. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was pretty close to the end of the review. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there's, there's a little bit of material, and you almost can't even see that in there, but that's really enough to do an analysis on this machine. So that's right, yeah. Even, even though they're going to make grams of material on MSL, we need a, the amount that's about the size of a baby aspirin tablet. That's how much we need. Yeah, and I'll, I'll show you that. I, this is, uh, so let's see, let me... Uh, let me start the vibration. It's the, the, the actual machine going to Mars is, is about a 10 inch cube. And this one uh, is, is better than it's worse. The, it's, it's better because we don't have to have that big sample wheel with all the things on it. It's worse because we, we carry our own power. So uh, the spacecraft provides us with power. Um, you know, on Mars, but for us, we power with, the, with laptop batteries. So, so these these are pretty heavy in, the, in their own right. But this this thing is pretty well packed solid inside. So what you're hearing is 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 uh, there's a base. This works uh, very similar to the uh, sample holders on Mars. It, it looks a bit like a tuning fork. There's two sides, and there's a there's a piezo vibrator in the middle that that vibrates at the resonant frequency of this tuning fork. And that causes the material in there to move around at, at like a liquid. OK, so, so uh, it's a pretty clever device. My colleague, Philippe Sarazin, was the one who figured this out. And this actually got uh, NASA Commercial Invention of the Year this year. And I was thinking that it really ought to be something like a tricorder or something. I don't know why a thing that just moves dirt around should merit that, but you know, whatever. Okay, uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a, and take a little bit of the material, and this is unlike uh, MSL. And let's see. So I'm just going to put it on a little spatula here and then put it right in this hole. And this is, this is what would be coming down that little funnel and into the sample cells in the, in the machine. And this is, what, uh, this is like an external shaker so that we can uh, see what's going on to make sure the sample is good. So I just put this in here. And I don't know if you can see the grains running around in there. It, you can certainly come up later on and take a look. But believe me, they're, they're kind of going in circles. And the noise you hear is actually there's, it's ramping this piezo through about 2,000 hertz, which is the resonant frequency for this uh, uh, tuning fork. And then when it gets a resonance, it really shakes hard. So OK, I'm going to put this inside here. And 
And I'll stop the uh, stop this thing. Okay. And now I'm going to command it from here. I'm going to just tell it to. And once I command it to start going, I'll turn this around so you can see see it start acquiring the data. So let's see here. I'm going to call it quartz. I'm not supposed to know what it is, but I'll, I'll just call it that. I actually thought when I started out, I actually thought that there, were car there was carbonate. You know, I, I thought it was a carbonate sand. And I think that what the deal is is on the Gulf Coast, it's carbonate. And on the Atlantic Coast, it's, uh, it's, sil it's uh, uh, silica quartz. Uh -huh. Oh, OK. OK, and that would be? That would be calcite or a carbonate. Uh, well, I'm, I'm going to, well, that would be, okay, it would be. It would it actually be probably aragonite, which is what the shell is, which I'm not supposed to know either. But I'll, <laughs> I'll tell you. <laughs> okay, so start the analysis. And should start humming here pretty soon. Okay. So it finds resonance, and then it starts shaking right around the resonance frequency. And now it's, uh, now it's starting, to, uh, starting to take analysis. And let me see if I can find it here. OK. OK. So it's not showing anything right now. You should see the first little pattern pop up. This is about uh, four times faster. So we, we kind of juiced this one up a little bit because we could. We didn't have to answer to JPL for the power. <laughs> OK, there we go. So that's 10 seconds of data. And I can tell, because I know this, that, that the quartz, uh, strongest quartz peak is at 30.5 right there. So I could tell you right now that's quartz, just from that one peak. But, but uh, it collects data. Uh, and shows it to you as it's doing it. Now, we, we can't do this on Mars because obviously we have to wait for the, the acquisition and then link up to the, to, the, to the satellite and all that. So we won't know for a day. We have to tell it to analyze for five hours, and then we get five hours worth of data. But in the field, if I, if I can figure out what something is in 10 seconds, I move on. You know. So, um, whoops. OK, so I'll show you how to analyze this. And I'm, I, maybe I'll just, if I kneel down in front, would that be good? Or, or maybe I can do it upside down. Let's see. Uh, should I turn it this way? OK, and I can, here's what I can do. I can, I can go right here. OK, so, so there's, now that's only, that's now five exposures of 10 seconds each. That's fifth. 50 seconds of, of exposure. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take this data. Uh, let's see. Take this data and pull it down onto this computer. So right now it's resonant on this machine. And as soon as I, I collected, uh, as soon as I, um, let's see, processed, as soon as I download it, then it's resonant on my computer. And then I can use the programs on my computer to uh, do the analysis. So it just simply takes what you saw on the screen. Now it's going to open up in a commercial package called Jade. And it should open up this pattern here. There's the pattern. Now, uh, normally I'd have to subtract a background. This is a pretty low background, so I don't really have to worry about it. But let's go to Identify. Search match setup, and there's a. I have a full. Now the, the difference between minerals and inorganic materials is there are hundreds of thousands of inorganic materials. Uh, there's only about four or five thousand known minerals on the earth, so uh, so there's only four or five thousand to choose from. Um, if there's something that we don't know that isn't a mineral that occurs on Mars, we'll still be able to find it out. It'll be an inorganic compound that's unknown on the earth. And we'll just name it. We'll know what it. We'll name it. We'll be the guys who name what it is, and it'll be a new mineral. So, 
This is uh, called the International Center for Diffraction Data, Powder, powder Diffraction Files. Uh, and there's like, uh, they have a, a list of all the minerals that are present. And so all I have to do is go search match. And it'll look through all those files and figure out what fits. And it finds quartz. So there's quartz. And let's get rid of everything else. And then I'll go back to uh, do a quantitative, well, it's, single, it's a single phase quartz. So there's no neat reason to do quantitative analysis. But let me just uh, do a quick refinement to see if there's anything else there. Um, OK. Let's see, full with half max. So it only found quartz, and it found 100% quartz. Uh, but let's go to, if you just look at this, uh, it fit this pink line to the black line that was the observed data. And this is. Uh, this thing up here is the least squares refinement. So these are the residuals left after doing the fit. And that's, that's a pretty good fit for 50 seconds worth of data. So that's definitely quartz, no doubt about it. Now let me show you one more thing here while we're at it. Um, I want to show you what the actual sensor looks like in here. What, what one, let me show you what uh, the sensor that collected all the data looks like. And I can, I can show you an image of that. So I'm going to download now a, I'm going to download, let's see, I'll download one, a single 10 second uh, image, 002.tiff looks like it's called. And I'll say save it, save it to the uh, desktop. And now I have the issue of trying to find it. So let's see, let's open up. This is a program called Image that, that will show you you could use image for your own pictures, actually. It's, a, it's an image processing program. Uh, file, open, and I'll go to details, most recent one. Okay, so this, now let me just get this a little bit, a uh, little bit more contrast on this. Okay, so this is a single, uh, let's see, can you, can you see that? Yeah, there, you can see it on the screen, so I, I don't want to turn it around where everybody can see it, but the screen doesn't work. Um, this is a single 10-second uh, scan, and the, 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 the center of, of the undiffracted beam is here, and these are these rings. And this is the main ring of quartz right here at, at about 30 and a half degrees. And these are actual individual photons. So this, this, this detector, which is 1024 long by 256 wide, uh, each one of those pixels will, will identify a single photon, and they'll tell you what the energy of the photon is. So we're looking at individual X-ray photons that are striking this chip. That's just marvelous. I just, it's, it's always surprising to me when, that, when I, that happens. You know, if I, if I had figured this out in 1880, I would have certainly got a Nobel Prize. You know, easy. <laughs> <laughs> That's what progress is. This is just an everyday thing now. OK, so let's see. And, and I could you know, just let me blow this up a little bit. And you can see there are actually, these are individual photons that struck the chip. And all of these things are cobalt K alpha. I can see the energy of them somewhere. Let's see. Um, there's the x, y, and the value. And the value of these individual photons this is actually in what they call digital numbers, so it doesn't read out in, in energy. But those are all uh, cobalt K alpha, the, the energy of the tube. OK, let's, uh, so let's move on. Let's do something more interesting. Um, any, you know, any questions so far? Uh, um, you said it was going to analyze for five hours. This was, would be one sample? Cause you one sample. Talk about how many samples you have. Uh, you don't have as many as Sam. And I'm wondering, you know, talk a little bit about the strategy of taking the samples, how often you'll take oh, them, okay. how okay. many in the two actually, years, and yeah. what are you going to reserve for future years? Good question. A actually, the, the sample wheel in, in the Kevin instrument on MSL has 27 empty cells. And those 27 empty cells can be dumped and reused. 
So we have, we have 27 uh, pristine analyses in, a, in an empty clean cell, and then we can dump that sample and reuse it. Sometimes you might have a sample that just gets stuck in there and, and that, that, that thing is lost. But uh, yeah, we vibrate it and, and turn it upside down. Oh, sure. Yeah, there's, there's a, the wheel is about the size of a pie plate. It's vertical. It's vertical. And it's, it's analyzed at the top. And the, the, the funnel comes down. The, the analyzing cell is at the top. And the, the beam is up here. And so it vibrates, does the analysis. The CCD is here. And then when we're done with this, it rotates 180 degrees. So it's upside down. And there's a sump down there. And you vibrate it, and the material comes out. And then we're ready to do another analysis. If you have successfully dumped the sample or not? We, we can tell after fashion. We can, we can rotate the cell back up. Uh, we, can do, we can do some analyses and see that we only see clear windows, just the, just the polymer windows and no material. Now, the caveat is if there's stuff stuck in the corners and stuff, well, we don't see that. Now, uh, there's a way, and so there's a potential for ca contamination in a, in a cell that we reuse. Now, there's, there's a strategy for fixing that. And basically, it's, it's, it's uh, sample dilution. What we do is we take a used cell, if we want to renew it, uh, run it up to the top, and we have, uh, we have the, uh, uh, the ability or the option to take up to three aliquots of material from the SASPA system, at one at a time, vibrate them, turn it over and dump it, fill it up, vibrate it, turn over and dump it. And hopefully by doing that, we dilute the contamination with the sample we're going to analyze and then dump it. And we also have a, a, what we call a sample shunt. It's just basically a, a big hopper that holds material. And if we think the, the funnel is, is contaminated, we can pour stuff through the funnel and dump it and pour stuff through the funnel and dump it. So we have ways to, uh, to kind of clear the, the machine of contamination. Now, None of this stuff is perfect. I mean, it's really, I'll tell you, the, the high ground is trying to deal with dirt. <laughs> you know, how do you do it? So that really is, you can make really fancy machinery, but just trying to transfer fine grain material from one place to the other is, is really tough. It's really tough. Phoenix. Exactly, yeah. And we have a little bit, well, I mean, when we saw the results from Phoenix, uh, everybody had a powwow. And the idea was, you know, we, we, we don't know what's going to work if we get in a situation like that. But uh, Gentry Lee, who's one of the big gurus uh, on, our, on, our, on the committee that's reviewing us, or the whole, in, the whole uh, mission, basically said he wanted as many knobs and dials on this thing as he could. So we would have things to, to twist and, and change to see what we could change to, to make it work. So, but we don't know, you know, nobody knows what you, when you go to some new place, you don't know what you're going to find there. So it's, it's, and we're, we're, we're very worried about clogging something. Yeah, you should be because yeah. of Phoenix. It was a major exactly. issue. Yeah. And they, you know better than I did. Mm -hmm. I followed it closely, but yeah. I'm sure you were intimately involved yeah. in it. They took the huge samples, mm -hmm. which I thought, because I'm a chemist, I, I thought they were too huge and too big. Yeah. And I, I, I hope you're going to avoid that, or what are you going to do to avoid taking giant samples that aren't going to go through, the, through that filter? Um, and overly large samples. Yeah. Maybe I thought they took overly large samples, actually. Well, I, I took the cowardly route and figured it was the SASPAS business. Whatever they gave me, I could handle. <laughs> but the reality of it is uh, everybody's worried about that. And the first samples we take, uh, we've got an observation tray. They can pick them up, throw them on, on the ground. Uh, you know, the SASPAS system could, could process some material and then pour it on this, on this uh, observation tray. We can use the... Uh, the uh, hand lens instrument, Molly, to, to look at it. Uh, you know, many things, we, you know, we really don't want to make the mistake of clogging something because that would be seriously bad. And dump that, that uh, filter then. Oh, this right. one, yeah. Yeah, and they, they do the same thing, you know. If dump it, the whole thing. Yeah, let's go like that. And uh, I, I don't know if... Well, I mean, let's see. You're gonna, the sample is going to be sieved through there, but then what's left you can dump out. Yes. How yeah. does that work? Uh, I actually don't know. I mean, they have, it's, a, it's a clamshell system. I, I haven't seen this, the, the Chimera system actually uh, dump samples, but they have the ability to, to scoop material, sieve it, and they can sieve it to two uh, dimensions, to one millimeter 
uh, which the SAM instrument can take, and to 150 microns, which the SAM instrument can take and, 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 and I can take. Uh, and that brings up another question. Okay. Sorry to ask so many <laughs> questions. Um, is this, are you going to take some of the same samples for SAM and Kemin and analyze both exactly. of them? Exactly, yeah. In fact, that's uh, the, the one thing, I mean, you know, I talked about how mineralogy is going to tell you the environment. Well, it, it, it also tells you, I mean, there's, there's no context for an organic measurement without knowing what it was in. And so the, the Kemin instrument is going to provide the context for the SAM measurement. So, and it's, it's, it's really critical that we get the same sample. So you're actually going to um, get the data back from Kemin first? Uh, Is that's, that what you're that's saying? That's to be decided. No, it's, no, I mean, we, you know, it's going to take some pondering to figure out what we got. But the plain fact is that Kemin's going to take probably one night uh, of analysis to, to get a result, and that's going to be sent down. Uh, the SAM instrument, depending upon what kind of analysis they do, that could take one or two or maybe even three days. So, so we can't possibly do the analyses at the same time. Uh, we'll have the same material, and after that period of both things being analyzed, then we have to sort it out. Yeah. No, what I meant was first you'll look at the sample by Kemin, get the data, and after that, then put it into SAM. Um, That's not at the same time, because it wouldn't make any sense. Then you don't get the context. Yeah, certainly, certainly that that will be done. But at at the same time, well, let's see. I I think uh, the you know unless it's very clear that this is not an interesting sample, the the process of drilling and sieving and all that, and and you know stopping at a rock, doing everything else, and saying okay, this is important to drill, drilling it, having the material, and sieving it. That's a multi-soul thing. And I think once we get to that point, we're going to analyze it. I think there, there was a lot of thought going into, this is important. And, and so at that point, it's probably going to be an automatic unless we think there's going to be some kind of clogging or jamming or a reason why we shouldn't do it. So and Kramer from Space Flight Magazine didn't yeah. ident identify myself. OK, Sorry. OK. Yeah, so, so let someone else ask a question. OK. Then. No, th that was, no, I mean, that's, that's, we're worried about this all the time, you know. Uh, okay, should I, uh, I tell you what, why don't I move on, well, okay, I'll, I'll do the equivalent of, of uh, this is the great thing about being on Earth, I'll do the equivalent of, of, of dumping a sample and show you how easy it is. So if I, first of all, if I turn this upside down, uh, sample stays. Sure, yeah, yeah. So these are, these are two plastic windows, and the, pl and the plastic windows are 150 or 170 microns apart. And uh, the sample in this cell, the sample feeds through that little hole there. From up here? From, uh, from right here. I, I just dumped it in right there. Oh, now. And, let's and yeah. let, me show you, let me show you what it looks like. Well, as long as we're here, I'll show you what it looks like when it's shaking. And you can see that it's that it's moving. Oh yeah. And we have the ability to, we have the ability to, do this really strongly or at, in, in in all kinds of different ways, if we have. Uh, wow. And how long will this be going on? This will be going on on on, on Mars as as long as ten hours. But, but you know, I, I think that's very, a very conservative thing. I'm, I'm thinking it would be, we'll be able to do things in three, four hours. And that's called chaos mode. We're worried about, uh, you see that when you, when you just do this pulsing thing, things start to segregate out. Just like, uh, you know, if you have a can of mixed nuts, the, the, the big ones wind up at the top. You know, they sort themselves out by, by jiggling. And the chaos mode just really shakes it strongly and tries to homogenize everything again. So, okay, now let me show you this, this deal. If it's upside down, well, uh, not much is coming out, right? But watch what happens when I, when I vibrate it. So that's why vibration is important. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know what? I'll, I'll do this test. I'm, I'm going to make, uh, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grind up a clamshell. And 
I didn't do anything. I didn't try and clean this out. I just turned it upside down and shook it. So, yeah, so what I'm going to do is I'll, uh, I'll put the next sample in and analyze it, and we'll see how much quartz is left, okay? Uh, it can get stuck. If it's, if it's, if, and we have uh, my, my, my colleague uh, Dave Vanneman is, uh, is on this special team called the, I don't know what it's called, but it, it's like the really horrible materials team. <laughs> and they're, yeah, and they're analyzing literally stuff that we know is horrible, like, like ice chips mixed with dirt. Yeah, yeah, and that's one of the ones we're going to look at. Yeah, and and we 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 literally don't want to look at that. We we I would suggest we can't look at that mm. because that I, I've done. I mean, I this actually will work okay. with liquids. Well, that's why I'm asking. Yeah, the I've question. done I've done liquids, and and in fact uh, this works with grease, but but you have to clean it out afterwards. Right. You know, and I don't want and I can I can use other cells, but I can't use other funnels. I only have one. So we, we, you know, we would do everything in our power not to get a sample like that inside our system. Mm. So when you put your table, your, your observation table, can you take that sample and use it again? Uh, no. Okay, because no. I was thinking it would just sublimate and then you wouldn't have to worry about the water anymore. Uh, true. What, one of the things we thought about, I mean, we've thought, you know, we've really thought about this a lot. One of the things we've thought about is, so you, you, you drill and just throw everything on the on the ground, and look, or on the observation tray, see what happens. And if it's the kind of thing you want, and you can sublimate the ice, or if that's what it is, then you can go back with the scoop and take some of the stuff that you t either that was residual around the hole or that you dumped on the ground and scoop that up. But uh, you know, we really, really don't want to have a a, a one-off. Uh, 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 you could call it a less than nominal uh, collection. We don't want that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let me. Uh, so we're going to do two things here. I'm going to I'm going to analyze a clamshell, and I I'm going to pretend I don't know what it is. And you saw I didn't really clean out the cell. It's right here, and there's still a little bit of quartz left in there. Now we we would actually dump and fill and dump and fill a couple of times to to clean out the contamination. But let's just see how much in this in this analysis, how much contamination left from quartz. So now I'm going to, I guess I'll do it. This is why uh, geologists are, are so well balanced, because we really can take out our aggressions. <laughs> on a, and on a, yeah, this is our whacker. OK, that ought to do it. OK, now let's get rid of this. I'm assuming a lot of this is going to be on the cutting room floor, maybe. <laughs> okay, um, maybe not. <laughs> okay, so here's my here's my sieve, and uh, you know, I, maybe I can. Sh if you want to see what the size is, now's a good time. Um, it's re it's pretty fine grain, but that's actually very coarse for the kinds of analyses that we do. Yeah, it's. it's And yeah, this yeah. Mango? Oh, this is just stainless steel or brass or something. Like stainless yeah. steel behind my lab. Yeah. And I have some really expensive ones that are nic pure there nickel. Some of them can contaminate, actually. Mm -hmm. But I guess you've done those experiments to figure out yeah. what could come through. Yeah. Now, uh, so let's see. Okay, so now I'm going to take this material that I smashed and dump it in here. And I'll thwack it. OK, and there's a lot of material in there from, from just doing that one thing. So there's, there's probably half a gram, which is may, way, way more than I need. You need a few milligrams. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So that I did exactly the percussion drill is it just pounds on things and, and then and then it, in, it it entrains the material of the drill stem. So basically doing this is very similar to what's going to happen 
on MSL. Okay, so now I'm going to take my contaminated ones to use cell and put this stuff in there. And put a little bit of this. I don't need to do that. Okay. Okay, so it's filling up nicely. And I'll put it in, the, in here. And I guess I still had the other analysis going, so I'm just going to stop it. So I'll stop that one. Start another one. I'm going to call this one seashell. <laughs> okay, I'd love that. Okay, I call this uh, seashell and tell it to go. And now let me get it over to where we can see what it's doing here. Okay, seashell acquiring. And uh, we'll see what happens. Now, you're going to see something interesting here. Um, the, the, uh, the pattern that shows on here is the raw pattern, what we call the, the film pattern, just a raw pattern. It's not, it's not segregated by energies. And uh, this happens to have a lot of calcium in it, right? It's a calcium carbonate. And calcium carbonate is strongly fluoresced by cobalt. Cobalt, which means it's, it's, it, it will form a, a, a higher background than you see, saw in the quartz thing. You should see a, like a, a mound. Oh, there we go. Okay, so obviously it's not quite as strong a diffractor as quartz, but let's, let's wait for a bit and see what happens. Okay, and let's go over to X-ray fluorescence and... I should be able to show you a lot of calcium. Okay, so this is log scale. So uh, this, this peak of calcium is actually 1,000 counts, and the background is down here around 3. So that's a lot. So what you're seeing here is you're seeing this is the cobalt peak. This is the peak from the x-ray tube. There's a little bit of iron here that I think is a contamination from the camera. It's a commercial camera. And this is cobalt, uh, or rather calcium K alpha, calcium K beta. Now this, this particular instrument isn't very good at x-ray fluorescence because we have a big thick brilliant window on the camera because this is used all over the world and if we l break vacuum or lose the, the window, uh, then, we, then we lost it. Yeah, so, so that's, uh, there we go, there's, there's calcium. We don't see much below calcium with this particular instrument. Aside from that, you see a little bit of iron, and this is the cobalt peak from the x-ray tube. Okay, let's go back to diffraction. Okay, so you can see there's a much higher background here. This high background is, is actually that calcium being detected, and you, you'll see it if I showed you the, the actual image of the chip. You would see there's a lot of counts that aren't on diffraction rings, and those are calcium x-rays. So... Uh, no, quartz, quartz is fairly low energy. With, this, with the uh, MSL instrument, we, we could. With this one, we can't. Okay, I'll just let this go a couple more times because there's a lot of noise here. And, oh, okay, quartz is coming in right there, so we'll see a little quartz. This is contamination from the previous analysis. That's right. That's right. Yeah. You, you would shake it for a little bit, dump it, fill it again, shake it, dump it, and then the third time you do the analysis. And that, it's very yeah, effective. You've got plenty of sample to do yeah. it with. Yeah, it's very effective. Okay, I'm going to stop right here, and I'll, I'll download this pattern, and uh, we'll analyze it. And something you're going to see, you're going to see that the background of the, of the uh, pattern that I, that I download doesn't have as high a background. And the reason is, this is called uh, what we call film mode. It's just showing you every, every photon that strikes the CCD. When I download a pattern, I'm going to download something that's filtered for cobalt K alpha. So, so it shows you something that, that is, is only has the energies of cobalt K alpha, which will get rid of that calcium fluorescence. 
So let me go to files, uh, and I want to go to processed, and I want this K alpha MDI. Okay. And open. Okay, so you can see this is one of the advantages of, of being able to filter, to energy filter an x ray pattern. You get rid of all that fluorescence. So this, this still, uh, let's see, I don't know how many, uh, how many 10 second collections we did, but that's, this, this would be way early for me to try and say anything, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, okay. Uh, search match setup. And with this much uh, bad, uh, with this much chop down here, the computer always finds weird stuff. So this is, this is why it's fortunate to still have a job. Okay, so there's uh, aragonite, and that seems to fit pretty well. And it, it didn't find quartz, but uh, let's see here. Let me type in quartz and we'll see, see where it is. Um, okay, and I'll drag that over. So I'll put quartz over here. I'll get rid of everything else. And now I'm going to analyze for those two materials. And let's see. Um, okay, two phases and go. Okay, so here's here's what it found. Uh, let me let me change. Well, it's kind of hard to work upside down. Let's see. <laughs> I think this is it. No. Um, let's see. Let me do this. Okay. And this is it, maybe? This is it. Nope, that's not it. This is it. Nope. There we go. Okay, so here's the residual. That's not a bad fit. And let's see. Now I can't find my other thing. Um, well, I completely messed this up. Let me uh, see if I can find this other um, shade. Let's try it again. Well, now I can't find my. Now I can't find the other thing. Looks like I dragged it off scale off the off the thing here. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. Okay, let me do, uh, oh, you're right. Uh, let me do one more thing. I want to, I want to show you something really cool. Uh, okay, well, I've shown you a bunch of minerals. And once again, I'm not going to spend too much time. There will be some cam contamination with the analysis because I want to, I don't want to waste time doing anything. Uh, well, it also, I wanted to show you about spin-offs and commercial applications and, and ways this is useful. Uh, it turns out that almost all pharmaceuticals are crystalline. And this is a Bayer aspirin. And you can do analysis of drugs with this. So I'm going to analyze this Bayer aspirin, which I don't know what it is. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's see. I need to dump this stuff out. This shouldn't take too long. Yes. Uh, they will drill uh, as much as, well, I don't know about tens of grams, but maybe 10 grams of material. So it's way, way more time than, than we need. Okay, there's a little bit of powdered, uh, we don't know what it is. And uh, 
And it's definitely going to be mixed. Well, let's see. I wonder if I should try and. Well, it's just going to be contaminated a little bit. We won't worry about it. And I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's do this. <laughs> Wants to see if he's got good drugs with him? Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's, now I'm going to run this again. And... Okay, I'll stop this one. And well, I might as well talk one. The, the, uh, I, I knew that I knew that I could do this with my instrument, and so I actually contacted. I got really interested in uh, malaria drug screening for for uh, third world countries and. It turns out that between 50 and 90 percent of the drugs in uh, Southeast Asia and, and Africa are, are counterfeit, and especially malaria drugs. And so I've been analyzing, I've been working with the Republic of Vietnam to get a database and, and try and get this into their system for identifying counterfeit drugs. And, and they, they seem to be pretty interested in doing it. They've already sent me like two or three hundred things to analyze. Oh. And what I really want to do is I want to make this, it, it is obviously very simple to operate and we want to make it real turnkey just like you would for a, you know, like a bomb sniffer at, a, at an airport security place. Okay, let's see. Okay, and while I'm, okay, let's see. So this might take a, uh, uh, why don't I let's let's let this accrue for a little bit, and I'll just answer questions for. We're available. Is that on the rover, or is this data oh, no. that's downloaded no. and then you? It's uh, what what happens is we we had a lot of uh, questions about about that, and it turned out the the best way to do it, the safest way, is we take the raw data. The, the, this the Kevin instrument collects all the raw data, all those individual frames, and the rover compute element then does an algorithm to make this this summed up. 2D image, and that 2D image is sent down to the ground, and then we make the 1D scan and do the analysis there. So uh, it's it could be very turnkey, but we we simply don't know what it's what's going to happen up there, and you we want to have as much human in the loop as we can uh, without causing problems. When you say 2D image, you're talking about the one with the cir circles on it. Yes, uh, the the circles that that yeah. that those diffraction circles will be sent down. Uh, about ten of those per analysis, so about some sum, sums of one hour each. Ten of those will come down, and then we'll we'll do the 1D conversion and do the analysis on the ground. Sweet. That just saves a lot of wear and tear. We you know we don't want to make the spacecraft do more than we need to. <laughs> okay. So let's, uh, so that's, uh, there's the pattern. That looks like a pretty good pattern. Let's see if we can figure out. Now, I hope this works. Okay, so now I'm going to go to files, uh, processed. I'm going to do a film because I don't really have fluorescence here. That'll give me more data. Download, open. Okay, there's the pattern, and I want to put. I'm going to put a background on here to get rid of this uh, this background. Fit background, uh, cubic spline. Okay, that looks pretty good. Identify, search, match, and this time I'm going with this organic data set. This is uh, 450,000 crystalline organic compounds. It's going to it's going to search 450,000 possible compounds, and. Uh, one of the one of the problems with the database that, that I use is it's it's got everything but the kitchen sink in there. And the thing is that pharmaceuticals are like minerals. There's only a few thousands of them instead of 450,000. So we really need to make a database that actually suits what we're doing. 
you know, why, why look through the woods when you know it's, in the, it, it's just in the, in the shrubs? Okay. Okay, uh, it found uh, two acetyl oxybenzoic acid. That's, uh, that's aspirin. So there's an, there's a, there's an analysis of an aspirin from my, uh, from my aspirin bottle in the hotel, <laughs> which I used this morning. Uh, uh, yeah. So, okay. So, okay, so let's see. Then uh, maybe it's, can we go to the slides just for the last couple of slides, and I wanted to show you. Uh, okay, this was the next slide. This is what I read when I discovered this thing about uh, malaria pills, and I, this was in the Smithsonian Magazine a couple of years ago, and I, I contacted the scientists that they, that they described in there, and I, and I worked with them for the last couple of years. And uh, so that's how I kind of got into it. And uh, this is uh, acetaminophen, and this is actually uh, wheat starch, just normal wheat starch. And that's what they use as a binder for the malaria pills. Uh, next slide. This is uh, called uh, Metaplantex. It's one of the, one of the uh, and the thing about malaria drugs is on, there's only one miracle drug left, and if it's, if it's abused, then w there will be resistance to it, and we won't have it. That's why it's so important. So this shows you a quantitative analysis of this Metaplantex pill, which was supposed to have 17% of artesanate, which is the actual active ingredient. And I wound up finding 15.5%. Uh, so that's not too bad. And it, it basically suggests this is a good pill. Um, I think that's it. Next slide. Maybe that's the last. OK. OK, good. OK, well, so that's. Uh, that's it. <laughs> and I'll, oh yeah, thanks. It's Can you show us where on the rover, if there's a diagram maybe uh -huh. on, the, on, that, on the booklet there, mm -hmm. where is the instrument? OK, it's, it's inside the box. So where? Where inside the box? Uh, if if the you front look at, OK, or if, the back if or middle it's in the or front. Or and if you, look, if you look at the top front deck, mm -hmm. there, are, there, there are, are three covers for funnels. Now there's there's uh, on one side there are two funnels that's Sam and the, the two funnels are the oh yes and and then the one funnel and and actually in, in the in the MSL uh, in the MSL movie they show what, that they show you know they, the thing goes around and dr drills a rock and analyzes something that's the Kemen funnel and that's the Kemen instrument they're showing so is going to take the sample uh, collected by the drill and dump it in there yes. And it is how wide? Pretty, pretty the funnel. The funnel is about, yay big, and it oh. has a, and okay. it has about a three millimeter diameter uh, um, portion that goes down to where the, the it drops into the cell. Okay, three millimeters, right? Yeah, and I'm thinking of that tiny model, and that's this. That's um, yeah, actually very misleading. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So the, the the actual mechanical part, the drill bit, you've, you're taking three of them to Mars. Mm -hmm. uh, what's you expect? I mean, how many samples can you drill? Do you expect to be able to drill? Uh, good question. There's yeah, they have. They're able to. I think the. I I, I don't think they expect they're going to wear down a drill. Maybe they maybe they will. But a, a lot of it was just so that if a drill gets stuck in a rock, they're not they're not anchored there for the rest of their lives, you know. So, uh, but they're. Uh, they're they're certainly using them as as uh, consumables. So uh, the the real question is on Gale, you know, we we're we've got a 20, 20 uh, kilometer ellipse, and we're going to be doing a lot of driving to get to the clay regions which are at the edge. And so there, I don't know that there there will at least be heightened discussions. I wouldn't call them arguments about what we're going to do. People are going to want to analyze every rock they see. People are going to want to just head for the hills. And the real answer is we're, we're not going to be drill limited or sample cell limited in SAM or Kemen. Uh, we won't be resource limited for any of our stuff. Uh, it's really going to be, there's going to be a lot of driving to get to some of the really good spots. And so uh, we don't expect to hit 75 samples, or which was the original uh, requirement for this instrument. Uh, but we can we could analyze 75 samples, and I think Sam is in a similar uh, situation. So, 
I don't think there's any consumable related reason why we're not going to be able to analyze what we want to analyze. It's really just going to be drive versus, uh, drive versus drill. Well, you know, when, you when you say 75 samples, it sounds like so few. I mean, are you hoping to get more um, than that? No, I, it's, that's actually quite a, quite a few. And, and the, the fact is, I mean, I, I, was, I was kind of defending this concept of what I was doing and all, all this other stuff to somebody uh, who, is, who is a real Mars guy. And basically, his comment was that the very first analysis of Mars soil that we get, the first quantitative analysis of mineralogy is going to rewrite the book. So I, I you know, uh, and it, and really, if we wound up analyzing 75 of the wrong things or 75 of the same thing, we wouldn't, wouldn't learn anything. So I think there's going to be a, a lot of, uh, just a lot of huge thought going into, do we drill this? You know, do we drive there? Do we look at this? And, and with 350 scientists deciding this in a, in, a, in a tactical time scale of like eight hours, it's going to be real interesting to see. <laughs> Excess and the most power on, yeah. on, on the rules. Yeah. Uh, let me stop this. So this is, this is essentially the first mineralogical instrument. That's I thought right. Actually, was one of those. Um, okay. Well, the the uh, let's see. The APXS instrument is not a mineralogy instrument. It just tells you elements. So if you if you analyze a lump of coal, you wouldn't be able to tell it from a lump of diamond. There's nothing wrong with it. It's a great instrument, and, it, and it's, the, it, it's provided really useful data, but it's not a mineralogical instrument. Now, the, the Mossbauer spectrometer does do mineralogy, but it, and, it, and it does mineralogy of iron-containing samples uh, just e exquisitely. And in fact, Dick Morris, who does all those analyses, is on my team. Uh, but anything that's not iron-containing, it, it's just not there. So, so this will give you the full suite of minerals that are in soils and rocks. OK. OK, well, uh, I, I guess that's it. Uh, happy to hang around if you want to. Thanks.